<laughs> uh, Hickok 45 coming to you with a 54 caliber Hawken Thompson Center. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful day. It is. First hole in the new burn barrel, too. You saw it first. I don't think you have ever seen us with a burn barrel that was not shot up, already ventilated to some extent, right? <laughs> oh boy, it's gonna be a great day because the weather is perfect for this. The kind of weather I always order, try to, for a muzzle loading uh, event. And this is a beautiful thing. Look at the smoke still hovering out there. That's what makes it so beautiful. I'm just gonna go ahead and shoot that uh, two liter right now while I'm thinking about it. Some of you fell for that, didn't you? Yes, this is mine. Uh, well, we also appreciate uh, Jedediah Smith, Jim Bridger, Kit Carson, Teddy Roosevelt. Oh man, others I can't even think of. Jeremiah Johnson, right? <laughs> that uh, I think that movie, that story, that novel, I believe that was a novel, was based on, what's it, Jedediah Smith? I, I'm not sure, but uh, at least in part, perhaps based on the mountain man experience and the Hawken rifle. But that's what this is, a Hawken style rifle. And uh, I, I, I need to talk while I'm loading, don't I? Let me move it around here and I'll just be reloading. And so I'll be uh, doing something useful while I'm telling you about it. You have seen the, uh, just this quickly, this is the Thompson Center uh, Hawken rifle. And these were started in, in 1970. They came about, hit the shelves, and they basically are responsible, essentially, for the resurgence, you know, in muzzle-loading hunting, okay? And uh, I got my first one, which was this rifle, this type, not the specific one. I had mine stolen in a 1997 uh, burglary, but uh, it was exactly like this in 50 caliber. This one's 54, and they're just beautiful rifles. They're well-made, they're American-made, and they quit making them. You believe that? I didn't even know that in 2012. So I'm going to run a patch through it, keep it nice and clean, and shoot the thing again. But uh, yeah, this this is a beauty. Yeah, I'll tell you, they, these were great rifles. They still are. There's a lot of them out there. They made a ton of them. Uh, they got kind of expensive. I think they were retailing for around 800 bucks. And uh, I don't know, I guess with everything they were doing to make them, it's like a lot of other firearms, whether it's a Colt single action or a Colt Python or some of these firearms that took a lot of hand work. Uh, you know, they just maybe got too expensive. There was a lot of competition. And uh, from the Italian guns and different things, I, I, Smith & Wesson bought Thompson Center too, and I don't know what role that all played. Some of you may know better. Share, if you know anything that I don't know, which is everything, right? Uh, but they quit making these in 2012. I was not even aware of it. I ran into this one at a gun show in Mastonville, Kentucky. And, uh, oh, dirt cheap. And I couldn't pass it up because it, it takes me back to my early days of muzzle loading. I'm gonna try to talk while I load. And that's always dangerous, trying to think about two things when you're muzzle loading because you end up dry balling, putting in a ball without powder. But uh, if you're not careful, so yeah, they, these are these are these great old guns. If you have one, you know what I'm talking about. You might have had one that you had trouble with, of course. Somebody has trouble with everything, but they're generally uh, very well made. They are fairly authentic too to the old Hawken. Now they have more brass on them. The actual uh, Hawken rifles that Jacob and Samuel Hawken built in St. Louis, where all the uh, furniture and everything was uh, just wood and iron. And uh, they weren't there. I don't think they put maybe any brass on theirs to speak of. Although some did, some of the builders did back then, just like this. Uh, I don't know if they had uh, these pieces up here. I've seen pictures of some of them, some of the old ones, and they had brass. There's one that looked a lot like this, except these are metal that I saw in original. But uh, the actual Hawken brothers, Jacob and Samuel, didn't didn't do that. But they made a rifle much like this, the half stock was popular and the large caliber. Most of them are, I think, 50, 53 caliber, something like that. This one's 54. And folks uh, going out into the fur trade, exploring into the Rocky Mountains and the Plains would stop off in St. Louis and, and often try to find one of these, try to buy one if they had them and uh, take them westward because uh, they were great rifles. They started that shop in around 1815 and for about 40 years, 
you know, all through the muzzleloading era and beyond, they built these things and they had a great reputation, great reputation, because they were big enough and powerful enough to take about anything you would encounter, you know. So, uh, so anyway, there I go talking. And, uh, and what I, here's what I do when I do that. When I get to talking, I go ahead. I mean, I know I didn't uh, like half ram a ball down the barrel because I never do that. So I, just to double check to make sure I don't have any powder in there. Or if I do, I'll find out, see? That's what I do. I did that once when I was messing around before the video. And uh, you can also run your, your ramrod down there. I knew there wasn't falling, but you can run your ramrod down there and see if there's any powder, you know, feel for it that's that way. So let me put another charge in and we'll load it for real, okay? Really do have to uh, focus on a couple of different things. There's some things I wanted to share with you in terms of these. Uh, you know I like muzzle loaders. Uh, <laughs> you know, I like everything, don't I, that goes bang. Uh, I usually let them air out a little bit before I get too crazy about <sighs> reloading them. But that's why you make sure your face isn't over it. And of course, I'm just putting powder in. Okay, make sure your face is not over the muzzle. And I'm using patches that are, see, these are uh, ox yoke and they're, yeah, 10 thousandths. That's how thick they are. And I'm using a 530 ball. And it seems to be a pretty good combination. Maybe not tight enough for competition. If you're going to compete with it or you were going hunting, you might want even a little tighter patch. And I've got some bigger patches. They're just a little bit thicker. And they're, they're, they work fine. It's pretty tight getting down and everything. But... If you're going hunting, you're not standing here just shooting one after another. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit hard to load, you know. Of course, this one's tougher because I didn't bore, uh, wipe out the barrel. There we go. Between the shots. Uh, so that's the main reason for that one. But you could you could have it a little bit tighter if you if you knew you're going hunting and you wanted the utmost in accuracy, you know, out at whatever, 80 yards or 100, whatever you felt comfortable with shooting it at, okay? So, let's take another shot. And, go boom. Hawk and rifle. Yep, 1970, these things came about. And, uh, really got a lot of people interested in hunting again. And, uh, you know, there were seasons, early, early uh, muzzle loading seasons, as there are now. And uh, uh, I remember it well. I'm going to shoot that cinder block just for heck of it. <laughs> oh, man, almost got off before I meant to. Good, uh, but I hit it. Uh, when you set that rear trigger, again, I, I've shown you all this in some other rifles. When you pull the rear trigger, nothing happens. I go ahead and cock it all the way. I think it's safe, right? There's nothing in it. You pull that trigger, and then this one becomes a hair trigger. All you have to do is breathe on it and, it and it pulls. So why would you have that set up? Uh, also, the front trigger will fire it, but it just takes more, more uh, uh, power, you know, to, more pull to, to fire it, uh, which is fine to use that too. But if you have a really precision shot, you get that thing up there, you can pull that rear trigger, and then you know that all you have to do is barely touch that front trigger. So it really does enhance accuracy. So you have a set trigger, it's called. All right. So now I'm going to patch. So I think the bore is a little tighter on this one than on my uh, Lime and Great Plains rifle, uh, which is fine. You just have to figure it out and allow for it. I haven't shot this much yet. Just got it. Uh, oh, when was it? Here we go. Tight. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just dampen a patch because I've actually fired a couple times. And you know, I have noticed too that. It gets a little dirtier if you fire without the ball in there, like I did. <laughs> it really does. So I put a little ballast on that and you could use other grease or you know, whatever, but I don't want to use enough to, to uh, penetrate the powder when I put it down there. Just to make that a little bit better to get in and out. I don't want to get that patch stuck down in there with the rod. That's always a pain. Now I'll run another one just to dry it. But yeah, uh, the Hawkin brothers moved west and opened up that shop. I think it was to, uh, 1815, like I said. And it was just a premier rifle. I talked about that in probably other videos. Uh, people talk about Hawkin rifles as just, you know, like they're 
with reverence, put it that way. Okay. And that's why in the, the movie, Jeremiah Johnson, you know, they talked about that, that you could tell uh, that uh, Hollywood was aware of that, right? And uh, he wanted a hawking rifle. And I think he only found, a, what was it, a 32 or something? But, <laughs> but then he, he uh, took advantage of uh, Hatchet Jack, he found. Froze to a tree, wasn't that the lie? <laughs> Uh, killed by a bear and uh, he borrowed quote unquote, his 50 I believe it was and uh, so anyway and movies always of course help the sales and that really spurred the sale of these things uh, no doubt about it I'm going to fire a cap just to be safe there to make sure I didn't get any oil I, I, I know I didn't but you know rather safe than sorry I do not want to have to extract a ball or or you know get it out of there somehow get powder down in there all right so yeah the hawking rifle uh such a piece of uh, americana and the originals of course are extremely expensive you know if they're any kind of shape at all especially i saw one at the nra museum in uh where's their headquarters arlington virginia yeah it was up there a few summers ago and uh saw one they got a little uh uh, diorama or whatever you know the Hawken uh, shop they made rifles and had an actual Hawken rifle which is pretty cool there we go there's just nothing like one of these they're they're my favorite I think they're my favorite still muzzle loader although I like the Civil War uh, rifles too like I said I bought my first one was like this in uh, 74 if you're around Nashville or you're an old guy or gal or whatever, you're familiar with Nashville, it was at K Hardware over in Donaldson. They used to have a little gun shop inside the hardware store. And they had lots of guns and they had these things. And, and I bought the first one there. And later I bought a, uh, okay, focus now. I bought a uh, 58 caliber Green Mountain barrel for it. And I would shoot it some. But I did notice the balls dropped a lot faster with the 58, you know, in this. And uh, so I shot the 50 mostly. This ball starter I bought early on uh, at Battle Grand Armory in Franklin. Old Charlie Hafner. I don't know if he made these or not. He was a national competitor, in fact, champion. Uh, you can see his name on the plaques up in Friendship, Indiana, the national shoots. Uh, and he worked there, got me into muzzle loading. And... Uh, I remember buying that there in 74, and that's the only ball starter I've ever owned or used, I guess. Still have it. That and this patch knife I bought there, Battleground Armory, still got them. Bought them in 74. I don't use the patch knife as much because I, I don't cut my own patches usually, okay? But uh, he invited me out to their range one time. I was really new, uh, fresh out of college, and, was, and I found that gun shop. and. Uh, he said, come on out and shoot real guns with us sometime. You know, he, he was a diehard muzzleloader shooter. I think that's about all he shot. And, okay, I went out there one Saturday off his back porch of the log cabin there, lean to in the back, and they were shooting these things. And there were three or four people shooting, and two of them had these. And I thought, man, what are those? I love those, the, the octagonal barrel and just the brass. I, was like, I just love that. And they let me shoot one. I was hooked. I was hooked. And I had to have one. Yep, old Charlie Hafner. His son, son still has that range in place. And they have a club out there. Al Hollow Gun Club, I think. Still called, I guess. That's south of Franklin, Tennessee. So it was just kind of random chance. I ended up in Franklin, Tennessee and uh, found those people. And was introduced to the fine art of muzzle loading. Let's just put one on the gong. To celebrate this rifle. Ha <laughs> ha, I hear it and I see a move. <laughs> Through the smoke. Oh, I'm not sure where I hit him, can't tell the light, but I heard him, that's the main thing. Boy. See, look at the rifle, isn't that pretty? It's a 28 inch barrel and uh I mean, they've been the same. I don't think they changed them that much through that whole 40 years. Uh, I, I remember the specs, you know, 28-inch barrel, you know, like one in 48-inch twist, 
because they were designed to kind of be a middle of the road. If you know you're just going to shoot round balls, you're not going to shoot conical bullets, maxi balls, mini balls, or any of those kinds of things, you want a, a slower twist for a, a, a round ball, patched round ball. It makes it a little more accurate. So a lot of these that are designed for that, uh, there are barrels for that, like the, the Great Plains rifle from Lyman, with a one in 60 inch twist. I think that's what mine has. Because it's really designed for round ball, for accuracy with round balls, okay? And then if you're gonna shoot just conicals, maxi balls or whatever, you want maybe even a little faster twist than this to stabilize the bullet, like a I don't know, one in 40 or something, 138, I don't know, ideally. But Thompson Center kind of split the difference so you could shoot both and still get pretty good accuracy. And I don't know, it always seemed as accurate as I could shoot. And uh, you know, so I haven't had any trouble with that. So it's kind of nice, you can shoot either one uh, just just fine. But oh yeah, it was, uh, I, those days were, were fun, getting into this for the first time and not really knowing what I was doing. Those guys were pulling my leg out there at the range that day, I remember. I, they had some solution they were dipping their patches in and I thought, well, what is that magical stuff, you know? And they, they were telling me all kinds of things and tales, you know, but it turned out it was just ivory soap or something they used. They used dishwashing soap. They poured into a little little canner jar. <laughs> and uh, the people, I've said before, people use all sorts of different things for, for muzzle loading, and they all swear by it. Boar butter or uh, Wonder Lube, uh, and it's all the best, right? It's the best. Some people just spit on their patches or whatever. Dip them in water. Just uh, so I'm kind of clean that. It's, I'm kind of getting used to it. It's pretty tight bore. I might think about a, I don't know, an even smaller round ball. I don't know. For most of the kind of shooting I do, I noticed uh, you can get them in 526. But it's got it's got a nice bore. Old muzzle loaders like this. This one was made. Uh, in around 2000, 2001 or two. So, you know, someone could really abuse the bore on a muzzleloader. You see how dirty they get. And what if someone just decided they're too lazy to clean it one day or forgot, you know, really corrosive, the black powder. And so, uh, you know, you've got to be aware of that. Check the muzzles carefully. I looked at this one with a flashlight before I bought it, even though it was a, a steel on the price. It looked okay. It looked kind of a little dusty something but it looked all right and it's okay so but uh back to the serial numbers the uh thompson center had a big fire it was in 97 i think it was and they lost two or three of their buildings and their records and so you, you really can't look up when when a gun was made one of these by the serial number and uh but i i searched around some forums and and I, it, people try to be helpful, you know, they post, okay, you can't get that information, but I bought one in 2000 and here's the serial number. And someone else, yeah, I bought mine in 2005, here was the serial number. And so you can kind of narrow it down within a range, or maybe even really close, you know, if you're lucky. All right, we got powder, let's put them all in. And, uh, oh yeah, these are, these are great. It's got the powder. Okay, got to focus here. So yeah, ball starter is important because you it, you got to really wrap it to get it started, and then you get it down the, the tight part of the muzzle and ram it on down. Okay. And generally speaking, the tighter it is, <laughs> the more accurate it's going to be. I think some of the people who compete with these things, they go oh, the extra mile. They have to use a, a special little kind of a ball starter and a hammer and everything to get it incredibly tight and uh, which would not be a lot of fun for me. That's one thing I like about the Civil War rifles. They're so easy to load. Now I'm not gonna shoot all these targets, but I wanted to set up enough to give me something to, some, uh, you know, some targets. We gotta shoot the pumpkin, don't we? <laughs> gotta shoot that. All right, I'm not gonna use a set trigger. I'm just going to. You know what, since I might not get all the tar, well, we to shoot the pumpkin. We gotta shoot the pumpkin, it's October. <laughs> Look at that, I didn't move it, that's great. But aren't these beautiful rifles? A am I just weird? Don't answer that, because I know I am. But that is a beautiful rifle. Uh, and that's the way it struck me in 74. And I thought, I've gotta do that. Uh, that just looks like fun. Uh, 
you know, loading those things, getting them dirty, and then they clean up like new. Uh, the brass, the American walnut, American brass. Uh, and again, these are made in America. Uh, one of the few, you know, muzzle loaders. Of course, they're not made anywhere now, but uh, they were made in, in America. And uh, so I am, I am just delighted to have one back. Kind of fun. Let me load another time or two here. You know, lies I didn't tell you about it. The old Thompson Center. Now, that company is famous for making uh, other guns too. The single shot pistols you may have seen, you may own one. I had one of those too with interchangeable barrels. And uh, you could, uh, you know, you got one. I had a, their single shot, and, and uh, I had one in 223, I had one in 44 Magnum, and I think I had a 410 barrel, 45 Colt. And you just pop the barrel off and put another one on, and you got a, a different caliber. And they still make those. They make some rifles, and uh, they make a lot of muzzle loaders still, I think, but they're all uh, the inline modern ones. So I'm going to go ahead and try. I think that's probably I'll put her past you to make sure we're in no big hurry either. We're gonna, I mean, we're going to let you all go for too much longer, but uh, I'm not in a big hurry. I might shoot right into the dark. There we go. These are fun. They are a lot of fun. So, uh, so yeah, Thompson Center, who now I think is owned by powder powder owned by uh, Smith and Wesson still make those things and uh, don't make these though not the traditional muzzle loaders and most of those now come out of Italy even the the Great Plains rifle by Lyman I think is made by one of the Italian companies for them and imported by Lyman so but these are still around you see these things at any gun show you know the pawn shops everywhere they made quite a few I don't know, I don't know, was it like half a million of them? I don't know what they made. I know I've seen serial numbers up in 400, 500,000, I think. So, I guess we better put a ball in, you think? Uh, so, anyway, uh, I had a lot of fun with mine. I told you the story about taking them out to the, uh, to kind of the recycling dump out in Franklin, Tennessee, where I would shoot back in 74, 75. I would take this out there. And I was always impressed with how well it would shoot. But then you know, I'd take it out to the range, of course, at Al Hollow, and would shoot metal buffaloes and different targets and knock them over. And I never did shoot a match, so uh, I don't guess I ever shot a match with it. Uh, I just enjoyed shooting the things. And uh, let's put, you know, we got to shoot. we got to shoot one of these cans. Like that paint can right there. And see if it'll move that two liter. <laughs> I sent him down the road. Didn't I? And one thing uh, that makes these uh, also different is it has a hook breech system on the barrel. You take this, take the uh, ramrod out, which you could use, it's just harder to use a shorter rod. In the field, that's what you'd use. Knock out the pin there, and it makes this easier to clean. There's a lot of muzzle loaders you can't do this with. Say hook breech, how's that? That's the breech, and there's a hook. And so you have the barrel. So it's so simple to change out the barrels. You can get replacement barrels. You can get the same barrel in a different twist, you know, anything like that, you know, different caliber. And uh, there's aftermarket companies that make them and, and all that. And uh, I used to clean it, and I still do quite often, is just put it, or this type, put it down in a bucket of like hot water, and a patch and a uh, ramrod, and just pull the water into it and just run the water till it's clean, and then hot water preferably, soapy hot water, and then uh, you know, rinse it with hot water. And uh, you know, use a toothbrush and just clean it up and, until you're getting all the dirt out and oil it down, should be fine. So. That's, uh, that's one advantage to these. When they came out with these, they were mostly, I think, 45 and 50 caliber. And, uh, and they had flint lock and cap lock. Okay. So, and you don't have to have that ramrod in it to shoot. I may shoot one more time here. Okay. So, a beautiful gun. Glad to have one. Doesn't maybe mean as much to, to you all, other than you can appreciate a fine rifle. But, uh, 
it's just kind of special to me and I'm really surprised I, I let this much time pass without getting one again you know it's such a piece of my uh, shooting history and I just sort of let it go I don't know I got into the Civil War rifles and different things after this one was stolen and I uh, enjoyed those a lot but the old uh, Hawkins and in reading up on them recently uh, I was reminded of how well these are respected uh, at the time I just knew they I liked the looks of them Rep Thompson Center had good reputation well made and everything uh, but there's a lot of them out there now different muzzle loading rifles and these things have a really good reputation for uh, quality uh, just they really do people uh, really value these things even though there's a lot of them out there on the on the used market but if you're looking for you like this type of rifle uh, and, and you would really rather go with an American made one uh, you know they're out there uh, they're all over the place that will probably change I think 2012 they said they quit making them so we got uh, was that six years Kentucky is that six and so you know they'll they'll kind of dry up but there's a lot of them out there that will get back on the market all right let's put a ball in I'll let y'all decide what what may be the last shot of that but only if you make a suggestion only if I can hear you okay and as I always say, if you've never done this before, you need to do it. You're really missing out because it's a lot of fun. Even though you get dirty, it's part of it, part of it. And also, if you're in competition, uh, you want to be careful about I don't worry about banging up the, the ball a little bit, the lead ball, but from what I'm doing, you want to uh, protect the ball and not flatten it out as you cram it down in there, okay? Get your load and the right size patch and that sort of thing so you don't have to bang on it too hard of course you know one thing we we really need to do before we uh, wrap up is it just would not be uh, appropriate if we didn't take a buffalo would it if i can it might take two shots but we'll do it I guess we'll take two shots. We'll try again real quick here. As I'm thinking, if there's anything else that uh, you're dying to know about it. Mmm. That's good. Ah, black powder residue. I love it. I love it. Powder measure. Yeah. Okay. Hawking reproduction. You can still buy them. You can even have a custom-made Hawker. There are people who make muzzle loaders, uh, just like anything else. Uh, you know, they may, you may pay, I don't know, three, four, five thousand dollars for it. There are people that will take, you know, weeks and weeks and build you a Hawking rifle or any kind of muzzle loader, and uh, they're in that. Uh, that's their their trade. Yeah, and then also there are. Uh, you know, I guess, I don't know, CVA still make them. Uh, who's that? Oh, Traditions. There's other companies that make them. Of course, the Lyman. And so if you uh, like these these sorts of things, they're available, of course. Again, uh, 54 caliber. Look at my hands. How do I get them dirty? These are 530 thousandths. Okay. And it seems to work okay. I need to get this thing out on an afternoon when we're not doing a video and shoot it about a hundred times and just become really familiar with it. See, I didn't clean it that time. Ah, I'm having to put some muscle behind it. All right. Okay. Well, he quit on a miss. Well, I, I guess I probably went a little high on that buffalo. I'm sure. I'm going to hold a little bit up on him. <laughs> popped him and I didn't have my ears on but uh, you know it didn't hurt my ears that's not good but these kinds of things they're just a big blast and a big boom 
and you, and you don't get the sun on my eyes here. That's okay. Let me back out of the sun. There we go. I feel better now. You, uh, yeah, you don't want to shoot them without your ears on, but uh, it's nothing like a modern rifle. Shooting a 308, or certainly a 556, or anything like that. Generally, the bigger the bore, uh, the less piercing sound you get, especially when the velocity is moderate like this. Uh, so anyway, the Hawken rifle, uh, I have a lot of history with it as I was just boring you with, uh, takes me back to the seventies. Uh, I just really, really like this thing. And, uh, there's a lot of history that other people have had, right? Like Samuel and Jacob Hawken, uh, and any number of folks, uh, went into the, they call them Hawken brothers, call them the, the Rocky mountain rifle. You know, it might've been partly marketing, but that's where a lot of people were going with them. You know? the Rocky Mountain Rifle. And uh, they served fur trappers and mountain men quite well. And uh, they have served me well. They, they really have. Uh, I used to, one quick story, I used to, I, I don't hunt as you know, but back in the early 70s, I did for a little bit, about a year, two year period, I thought I wanted to be, you know, do some hunting. And I hunted groundhogs mainly a little bit for about two years. I did a little deer hunting with one of these. Never did get a deer, thankfully, because I was scared to death I'd have I'd get one and have to field dress it, right? <laughs> but I uh, I remember being in the in the woods with my my hawk and just like this, deer hunting, and feeling just like Jim Bridger. You know, it was uh, it was really neat. No one had one shot. You know, it was a black powder, and I had it loaded. My bore was clean, and you know you got to make sure everything is there's no oil, you go down in there or anything, and, and take really good care of it. So I did that probably four or five times. I went out with it and uh, I felt like a real mountain man. I really did with my uh, Thompson Center Hawken rifle. So it's good to have one back. Many of you have them. I'm, I'm sure there's so many of them out there. So let us know what you think about it, what you've, uh, your experience has been with yours. Uh, so anyway, I could talk about it all night and shoot it all night, uh, but I'll, I'll let you go. So appreciate you all support and uh, and the fact that you support the people who support us and uh, we just uh, have a good time. Life is good. Welcome to the end of the video. Just uh, clear out this pumpkin for our annual pumpkin carving video. But since you're here, I want to remind you to check out our friends over at SDI, the Sonoran Desert Institute. They're a fully accredited online distance learning program where you can be certified in gunsmithing or get an associate's degree in firearms technology. So go check them out at sdi.edu. And also, while you're on the internet, make sure you check out our own website. We have merchandise like this. Some of it will be limited. This strip may not be available, but we have several that are going to be available uh, across the board. Hickok45.com. We kept it simple for you. So go over to Hickok45.com. Check that out. We've got merchandise over there. Um, there's links to all of our other social media, like Hickok45 on Facebook, uh, Hickok45 on Twitter, the real Hickok45 on Instagram. I have an Instagram page that, that I use uh, quite often. I show some back uh, behind the scenes and different things like that. Uh, John underscore Hickok45 uh, Instagram. And then uh, there's a Hickok45 and Son YouTube channel. Um, and there is full30.com. Don't forget to check that out. And I think that's about it. I appreciate you guys, and I'll talk to you later.